chapter 19, we're in a new series. This is lesson three or four of God's way to health, wealth, and wisdom. And the title of the message today is God's answer to anger. Now, you personally don't get angry, but others in the home might. So listen up and try to be careful and learn these things. Uh, we're going to talk about anger, and anger is a uh, it is diagnostic for lots of problems in our life. It's a very favorite tool of the flesh, and we'll just try to root out some of the things we can do to minimize the effect of anger in our life. Look in Proverbs chapter 19. Let me open up with verses 11 and 12. The Bible says, unlike WWF or people that think they're great when they throw fits, the Bible says the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. Strong men in the Bible, and women too, are peaceful people. They, are, they walk softly, they carry a big stick, but they don't run their mouth. They, uh, it says here, the discretion of a man, not to throw a fit, deferreth his anger. The best thing about a man is not, I love John Wayne, don't hold me wrong, not to John Wayne beat the fire out of everybody in town, but to know that you could and not for your good and their good. You, you defer that, and it goes right past you. Uh, today we continue in this series on this whole theme about true health, wealth, and wisdom. And this is very spiritual. It does uh, give you a mark as to what's going on in somebody's life, but it's intensely practical. This is God's answer to anger. And sometimes you know that you occasionally get angry, and you get angry almost always in an unrighteous way. There is a righteous anger. We'll study that today. Most anger is not that. And much more so, you ought to be gauged, and I ought to be gauged, by our ability not to fly off the handle. Somebody said most anger is unrighteous anger, and unrighteous anger is an acid that destroys its own container. I'll tell you that. Your pH in your stomach from hydrochloric acid is 2.0. That's the same as battery acid in a car or a golf cart or something like that. And God's made it where your stomach can handle that. But if you have enough stress, it'll weaken the mucosa that's providing that protection from the esophagus all the way to the small bowel, and you'll burn a hole in your stomach by getting angry. And the person that can make you angry now controls your life. You've given control of your life to any rascal that can get you angry. It used to be that uh, cigarettes were coffin nails. Well, this is the same sort of thing as far as coffin nails. A wise man doesn't fly off the handle. So we're going to break this down into four portions today regarding anger, and this comes up every day in your life and every day in my life, so may God burn them into our hearts. Nothing does more to ruin our testimony in the wide world than anger, and uncontrollable anger. Number one, speaking of uncontrollable anger, sudden anger, our first point is, to be controlled. Are you the kind of person that gets suddenly angry? Oh yes, I'm Irish. Don't paint the Irish with that broad brush. I'm a redhead. Well, you don't look like you have that much red hair to me, so I don't, I'm not sure I'm buying that. Maybe you brag. This would be very foolish for you to brag about your short fuse. You know, somebody says, I'm like a loaded shotgun. Just jostle me and I'll go off. Well, that will come visit you in the, in the uh, jail then. That's ridiculous. You're not, you don't need to be proud of that. You need to learn, and I need to learn today, what the Bible says about those who lose their temper. And by the way, they find their temper when they throw a fit. It would be better if they did lose it. That's the idea. Uh, those who are quickly jarred, set off, fly into a rage. Will Rogers, you remember all his uh, funny things that he said. Will Rogers said those who fly into a rage seldom make a good landing. And that's true. You just don't come down very nicely. Pay attention regarding sudden anger. Let's walk through Proverbs. You can learn a ton of Proverbs. You can learn a ton from Proverbs just by reading every verse about the concept in Proverbs. Look in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 17. He that is soon angry is really something. He's helping the chief wins the Super Bowl. He's going to show them everything to do in wrestling. No, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. You might want to step back when you say that, but it's true. And a man of wicked devices is hated. That's what God thinks about all this. Look at another one here. Um, the person prone to sudden anger, God says you're foolish. You say, are you calling me foolish? No, I'm too peaceable and you're too big for me to call you foolish. God's calling you foolish. What are you going to do now? There's nothing you can do. 
You shouldn't call me a fool, you say. I didn't call you a fool. God called you a fool. That's the idea. It's just a foolish thing to do to get suddenly angry. Look in Proverbs 15, 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. A good way to get into a fight is to have a quick temper, and a uh, good way to start an argument is just fly off the handle. Look in Proverbs 25, verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof. How about that? You go out throwing your name around, swinging those heels, you're going to do something big. All of a sudden, your friends had to go. There was an important phone call, and you're by yourself. And you're, you're singing a different tune now, aren't you? Absolutely. Go not forth hastily to strive. Here's us. Lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Well, I would walk 10 miles not to argue with my neighbor because that's just like arguing with somebody that lives in your house. We have all lived in our neighborhood for almost, well, no, we have lived there 35 years, and you just, you don't want to feel the waves of anger as you go out the door. Look in uh, verse 25, 8 again. You know what that means? Don't all get heated up before you hear the whole matter. Here's uh, Adrianism that's not in the Bible, I don't think. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it is a fool, so don't jump at conclusions. You may start something, you'll be hard-pressed to end. Here's another one, Proverbs 29, 20. Seest thou a man that's hasty in his words? Well, he told them, didn't he? He's as sharp as a razor, that guy. He's, all of a sudden, there is more hope of a fool than him. He'd have to study to be a fool. That is a foolish, foolish thing to do. If you are a man who is quick to wrath, quick to anger, hasty with your words, you're in trouble. You've got a lot to lose, and you're going to lose it if you don't change pretty quick. We begin to talk sometimes before we've even thought halfway through where this sentence is going to end. And uh, the Bible says sudden anger is to be controlled. Here's a few more, Proverbs 19:19. 19, 19. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment, for if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Some people just cannot learn, absolutely can't learn. Most of them young, lots of them male, but could be women too, I suppose. Uh, you, you know what you have to lose when you throw fits, when you're an angry person, when you've, you've just got venom dripping out of you? You can lose your friends. Friends are more and more important as you get older. You can lose your job. It's nice to be paid. They want money at Walmart. You can lose your wife. That would be bad. Best half of you by far. You can lose your children. They don't want to be around somebody throwing a fit all the time. Life's too short. You can lose your health when you get angry. Physiologic things happen in your body. Your blood pressure goes up. Your heart rate goes up. Your pupils change as you turn into a little slit-eyed monster and everybody starts running. Uh, your heart beats faster. Adrenaline is released. Your mouth gets dry. Your hands get sweaty. You may start to tremble. It's like you're a scary person. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even you. I'm ready to get away from you. Listen, it doesn't take a rocket scientist here. That is not good for you. And if that's true and those things I just told you are true, your life may be at the mercy of any rascal that will make you get upset. That's, you're giving control of your life and another nail for your coffin uh, to somebody you don't even like. If you have a short fuse, if you suffer from quick flashes of temper, you'd better get into the program here we're going to go through in the Word of God. Pray the Spirit of God to grow the spirit of peace in your heart since it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? You say, well, that sounds real spiritual, but what do I do? What do I really do? We're in the section, sudden anger should be controlled. Number one, you need to confess your anger. You say, oh, it's not a sin. It's just dad was like this. Yeah, dad and mom get along great now, don't they? No, don't pick that up from your dad. There's lots of good things you can get from dad, but throwing fits is not one of them. Hard to con You need to confess your anger. Now, this is hard because we're Christians. You say, well, do you get angry? No! I, I mean, no, no, I don't get angry. I'm very nice. Uh, no, you're not. You just threw a fit. You won't confess it even to yourself. We studied confession, that word, homologeo, to say the same as God. God says it's a sin. You say it's not. Who am I going to believe? Who's your wife going to believe? Who's your kids going to believe? We won't confess it, so we try to repress it. That's like taking... Uh, a trash can and lighting it on fire, the, the paper in it. Oops, it's getting smoky. You better put it in the closet. There, there, now, where's that TV changer? Let's move on with our day. It's not going to work. You, you confessing it, 
Uh, it would work, but you're not going to do it. Repressing it is not going to work. Trouble comes sooner or later. It's going to burn the house down. You say, well, I'll express it. I'll open the door and let in some oxygen, and we'll take some good deep breaths. You'll just whip that flame higher and higher, and it'll burn the house down. Somebody said, don't repress it, don't suppress it, don't express it, confess it, agree with God. Just say, yeah, I'm getting to be acting like a jerk again, and everybody behind you in your house goes, we know. It's not, it's not a not a joke here we of course we know that's ridiculous number one you need to confess your anger number two you need to consider your anger boy before you buy the uh, 04 or the 24 or the 25 car down at the dealership you're going over that thing with a fine tooth comb you've got a little toothbrush just to make sure there's no paint getting away you're considering every inch and every ounce of that car but what's more important your life and your attitude and your family and your marriage, uh, why am I getting so mad? You know what? When you consider your anger, that means you question yourself. You know, there's, uh, I think it's Psalm 42. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes a lot about this, about uh, whether, you, whether you need to question yourself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Okay? You're questioning yourself. Here's, here's, here's another one. Lord, I'm throwing a fit again. Why am I doing this? I know you've told me, but apparently I've forgotten. Why am I doing this? Why am I getting so mad? Remember Mark Twain, when you get mad, count to 10 slowly before you say more. When you get real mad, count to 100 and don't say anything else. That's exactly what you need to do. How do you consider this? Look in Proverbs 14, 29. He that is slow to wrath, that, that will buy you a lots of time uh, and you'll be able to get out of trouble. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. We live in a quick, quick, quick world, but I'm saying it may not be the best thing for most situations and most uh, decision processes. A little bit of time might be really just in order for you and for me. If you'll slow down, take time, God will give you understanding. Wouldn't you be ashamed? I, I've been ashamed many times that I'm 13 seconds from God showing me the answer and I butt in with my little idea and of course it's wrong again and God says, mm, you're so close to letting me deal with you and to talk with you. I think Mark talked last week about very few people will let the pastor counsel them. Well, same thing here. Very few people are going to let the word of God counsel them. If you wait just but a moment, he will show why you are angry and whether this is the case or, time, or this is one of those rare times to actually be angry. Number one, we're talking about sudden anger to be controlled. Uh, first thing you do, to confess your anger. Second, to consider your anger. Third, to control your anger. But I can't do that. If I could control my anger, I wouldn't need to listen to this message. Well, I'm going to show you that you're wrong. Uh, the idea here is you're, you're lying, and I, I hate to say that, but I've done it too. You can and you do control your anger. Look in Proverbs 29, verse 11. A fool uttereth all his mind. Okay, you just got to blab out everything you can think of. But a wise man keepeth it till afterwards. Wait a minute. You told me that you couldn't handle the answer, that you could, you can't, it just, it just pops out. It just open your mouth and all sorts of stuff comes out. This says, a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. That means God's instructing you and describing you. And if that's true, then you can do it. God doesn't make commandments that it's impossible for us to fulfill. God will not tempt us above that we're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that we're able to bear it. it you know, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't set up this program that we could bear and run away from sin if it was just impossible, if we had no hope whatsoever. So here's the example. Uh, husband and wife are in an argument. Husband's yelling at the wife. The wife is yelling at the husband. Kids are hiding under the bed. The dogs are in the backyard. They're snarling, fighting. The dogs get involved too. The phone rings. Dead silence. And then one of you, sugar wouldn't melt in your mouth, picks up that phone and says, yes? How can you say yes when a minute ago you were going berserk? And you just told me you can't control yourself. You can control yourself for a telemarketer, but you can't control yourself for your wife and your kids and your husband. You just, not me, I didn't say it. That's ridiculous. You just proved yourself wrong. You can 
control what you say and your attitude. Maybe not forever, but you can to get started. Uh, you are so sweet. How could you answer the phone that way? You can control it, and more than that, you know you can control it. With sudden anger, you can choose, with God's help, to be slow to wrath, slow to wrath. A man of discretion, it says, puts off his anger. He gives it time. Show me, Lord, why I am throwing a fit and ruining another evening. And you can see your kids and your wife going, oh, no. We were so close to actually having a nice evening. And then this is going on again. There's got to be some answer here. Don't say it can't be controlled over and over. God's word commands you to control your anger. God never commands us to do anything that we cannot do. That won't stand to reason. It won't fly before God and it won't fly before man. So number one, sudden anger is to be controlled. Number two, sinful anger is to be condemned. So I'm entering a new dichotomy. There's a sinful and not sinful anger. I'll give you a hint. Most of it's sinful, about 90%. There's a small uh, righteous anger that we'll talk about, but don't think you're going to load everything on that boat. It wouldn't hold it. That's not going to work. Look in our text again, Proverbs uh, 19, verse 11. The discretion, now the discretion is good. That's a wise use of your, of your uh, senses. Of a man deferreth his anger, and it's his glory to pass over a transgression. See, the world says he shows his weakness by passing over. Nobody talks that way around here, mister. I, he's he's going to punch your nose out, I'll tell you that. Yeah, you're not going to win this. Your voice just doesn't sound like a victorious voice to me. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is due as due on the grass. It says man of discretion. You know what that is? Uh, it is someone who thinks, who puts off his anger and thinks about it. Why am I angry? What is eating me? And if you will honestly take this question and arrive at an end where the uh, anger is pointless and wicked and sinful, then you can think immediately I should condemn this anger. Don't be easy on yourself. And one finger at you, three at me. I'm talking tremendously more than me than anybody I know in here. Uh, do not, uh, don't be easy on yourself in this matter of anger. Anger, despite what the counselors say, and I'm not against counseling at all, Anger is not weakness, it's wickedness. It's not sickness, it's sinfulness. It, uh, it is just not, not a uh, character trait or something. It is, it is an absolute sin and it has to be named and nailed as such. It just runs in my family. Well, then you're of your father the devil and his works he should do. I don't blame, and, and the human race is full of anger. You're, you're correct, it, it does run in your family, but you, you and I need to run it out of our family, and you need to help me and I need to help you. Don't blame heredity, don't blame circumstances. This is a narrow area that you have left to do something about. It's mainly confess and repent and believe and walk out in newness of life, which we're supposed to anyway. Uh, anger is a horrible, hell, hellish, heinous sin. Sudden anger must be controlled, and sinful anger has to be condemned. What about this sinful anger? How can you tell? You say, well, I'll jump on that life raft. Maybe my anger is sinful anger. Uh, excuse me, it's not sinful anger. It is, it is not anger, not, not sinful anger. If you don't have, number one, sufficient cause, you know, it's, uh, you know that it is sinful anger. Jesus said this, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of hellfire. What could that mean? That's pretty straightforward right there. Hell, hot, heaven, sure, judgments, Jesus uh, saves. That's the idea. Uh, Jesus said also, or other, the Bible said also, when we're angry and there's no legitimate reason for that anger, the anger is just the wickedness and frustration in us striking out at other people. Number two, if you have anger against a person rather than anger against what the person is doing, that's sinful anger. You, the people that are doing wrong are joining you on that bus and me on that bus. We're to love the people who are doing wrong. We are to be against the wrong that they're doing. Uh, but we're to love people and to love the sinner while we may not love his or her sin. You say, I cannot differentiate between sin and uh, 
myself. Uh, the, I may not differentiate between the sinner and his sin. You do it on the guy in the mirror every morning. You love that guy. I do too. I'm wishing him the best. Uh, but really, he does lots of wicked things. And, you know, you, you still love yourself even though you do it. Hopefully you're wisely saying, Lord, that was wrong. That was a sin. And God says, well, I don't hate you. I love you. Let's work on that. Let's help, help you out. Number three, not only is in sinful anger, anger to be condemned because it's anger against a person, it could be a desire for revenge. This is a problem of uh, your job description. This is a problem of your role down at work and at home, everywhere you are. Because you know this verse, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll repay. So when someone says, okay, buddy, you've had it now. I'm about to clean this place. I've had it with you. I'm going to I'm going to clean this up. God goes, you know, you don't do so good at that. You'd really be better to give that over to me. I can take care of it in a way that goes down three or four levels and comes up right. And you're going to stink it up worse. Think about all the times that you decided to throw your hand in there and you're going to take, you're going to straighten things out. How did that work out? You want a poll from your family? No, no, no. We don't want a poll from our family. That's terrible. It's horrible. <clears throat> Number four, if you cherish your anger, you can love it. As a matter of fact, that's what you do. You say, I'm just a <clears throat> tough guy. I like to push people around. I like to say terrible things. Now, that's who I am, and you're proud of it. That's sinful anger. It's sin that needs to be condemned and put away <clears throat> if you love your anger and you feel like you have a right to it. Well, you just better watch out because that's just who I am. Well, please stay away from our home. we got enough troubles already. If you have anger with an unforgiving spirit, that's sinful anger. And this is going to lead into another part of our lesson. Somebody has wronged you. This is country music theology. It's deep. Your dog, your tractor, your pickup, these are the elements of life. And if you, if you, if you get, if someone's wronged me and I am angry, the country music starts playing in the background. I don't mind country music, just I want the words to be biblical, <laughs> not wrong. I don't care what they did. If there's an unforgiving spirit in your heart, it's now sinful anger on your part needing to be condemned and repented of. That's the idea. So that's a pretty good way to, to nail down three or four specific ideas of sinful anger that needs to be condemned. Number one, sudden anger. Sudden anger ought to be warning. Somebody jumps out from behind the door, tries to start trouble. Try to, if you can, say, what's going on? Hold on, hold on, what's going on here? That's the wisest thing you can do. Second, sinful anger needs to be condemned. All right, real quick, one, two, three, four, any of those things going on there? Okay, yes. Well, you, you don't, you, I know you have to make decisions fast sometime. Number three, stubborn anger is to be conquered. Stubborn anger is a terrible thing. Look in Proverbs 19 and 11 again. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. One of the most glorious things you can do is pass over that which has hurt you or wounded you. You've had that, and most of the time we don't do so well. Sometimes we do. I can think of a guy that got mad at me one time for $50, which is what he owed at my office. I didn't even know he owed it at my office. He just went up and down two or three counties calling me everything wrong for years. And God, who has a sense of humor, put him right by me at a meeting at a big church up in Marstown. And they said, let's hold our finger in Psalm number 32 and turn and welcome your brother. And I thought, oh boy, I've been waiting for this. But it worked. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have made fun because I'm a Christian and he's a Christian. And he said, I have run your name down and I apologize. I'm wrong. And I said, well, you're a good man for doing that. We'll just start again. I gave him a big hug. Now, not all the stories end up that well. But occasionally, they do. One of the most glorious things you can do is to pass over that which has hurt you or wounded you to forgive, to restore, and to make right again. Matter of fact, let's talk about that in, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's take some of this uh, Proverbs in the Old Testament and move it into New Testament truth and example in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry, okay, where's this going? 
Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. This could be anybody, but it's usually taught and is correctly taught in the context of marriage. Uh, that's the idea. Be angry, sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Um, that is stubborn anger. Some people have learned to live with their anger, like that man did with me, for decades. I would just be exhausted. I'm not that spiritual, but I just don't. I mean, if you want to fight all day, another day is lost, and there's not that many days left in our life. Look in verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. Boy, that's it. When you connect those two verses together, be angry and sin not, N neither let the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. That's implying that when you are angry and sin not, or when you're angry and won't let up on it, you could be giving a place to the devil. You can say, come on in. Just sit down while I'm thinking of it. Matter of fact, come over here on the couch with me. You've, you've got a reputation for some rotten thinking. Well, I need some now because I really am mad at my wife. I'm thinking of new words to call her. This is not going to end well. You are on the wrong side. God's on your wife and family side every time on this throwing a fit like that. Some of you, I hope this is not true, but it was in the notes, so I'm going to leave it there. I won't look at you because I don't know who you are. Some of you, I hope this isn't true, have been angry for 10, 15, or 20 years. Surely not. I mean, this is just, this would just, I don't know how you're alive if that's true. Your adrenal gland probably looks like a raisin just squeezing every bit of epinephrine mm -hmm. out of your, uh, above your kidney there. You have a stubborn anger and the sun will rise and set and rise and set and rise and set on that same anger because you have an unforgiving spirit. Somebody in the country music industry again has done you wrong and you're not going to forget it. Real men don't forget. They strut around and take act. No, you, the Bible says it's the glory of man to pass over these things. That's the idea. That's completely different. Husband and wives can get mad and go to bed back to back, never praying, never on their knees if they need to be, no asking the other to forgive and God to forgive, but choosing to let the sun go down every night and building up a, a thicker and thicker and thicker layer of vitriol and acid. That's the idea. You know what you're doing then? You're saying, here I can hear you, I hope this isn't true. A devil, you're welcome to come into our home and and ruin our lives. The door is wide open. We have no reason. To, we're meaner than you are. Come on in. You can think of some things for us. This will be, and the devil goes, great. What have you done? Given place to the devil. We'll sit over here and fight. You can sit there with a dictionary and think of new words to insult the one that you swore that you loved more than life itself. That's the idea. Go ahead, wreck our home. Go ahead, wreck our health. Go ahead, wreck our happiness. Go ahead, wreck our testimony and destroy our lives. And that stubborn anger, this is well put, becomes the foul nest where the devil is to hatch more eggs of, uh, of meanness and rottenness. Uh, that stubborn anger becomes a foxhole where the devil can snipe at you all throughout the kitchen and the living room and the backyard and the front yard. That's the idea. The stubborn anger becomes the beachhead from which the devil is going to take an attack, taking more and more ground. He sees an open door. You left it open on purpose. He'll take it. Stubborn is a, anger is a horrible thing. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, it says, and here's how we're going to approach not living with sudden anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So there in one sentence, that's a packed sentence, there are six steps toward uh, putting off what is destroying your life and your family and your marriage. And it may not be you, but it might be your kids. Some people's in-laws both ways are not perfect. Hope it's not you, but it, there's nobody perfect. So we've got to keep our antenna up on this. Uh, number one, six steps to disaster. The anatomy of a horrible experience. First is bitterness. Bitterness is again country music. I have been done wrong. I have been done bad wrong. And something's going to happen in the next three minutes and 30 seconds of this song because of that. 
I'm going to get really, really mad and throw a big, big, big fit. Bitterness is the feeling of resentment that we have when we have been done wrong. The Bible calls a deep-seated bitterness like this a root of bitterness. My wife is small, and I'm lazy, and so when I know I should go out and help her pull big chunks of plants and flowers from the gardens this time of year, but a lot of them have roots, and boy, it's hard to get out. No, I do help her, uh, but, but, but th those, those roots are hard to get out. And until you get the roots out, they're going to be right back. So you're gonna, you've got to get deeper than you think on this. Unless you deal outside of gardening with the root of a matter. Or as my friends, when I lived in Missouri, the root of the matter. That's what, that's what you're not dealing really with anything. The devil first likes you to start here. You've been done wrong somebody's done you wrong and you know why because probably in this world somebody has done you wrong so we can flip that switch anytime we want it's always available people are just not that uh, honest or true or good anymore and here is where you ought to deal with <clears throat> deal with it right here but we don't deal with it <clears throat> number one bitterness number two wrath wrath is a slow burn inside okay uh you you hear the, when they show it in the movies, you can hear that little crackling sound when the heat starts to build up and the books start to catch on fire or something like that. Remember Fahrenheit 454 or 451? That's the temperature at which books begin to burn. Hot, bothered, inside your spirit, inside your soul. Bitterness turns to burning. Okay? Next, bitterness, been done wrong, true of everybody turns to wrath inside, which we can't see maybe, but we just, you get shorter. How you doing? Fine. Everything all right? Yep. You're, you're grown people. You know that's not true. Your wife says, something's going on here. Uh, he's th throwing a fit. Wrath on the inside turns to anger on the outside. Now, the fire leaps up. Uh, we have a gas fireplace in our living room, and it makes a little sound when it, catches on and the gas has been put in a little chamber and you've got the little uh, electric thing which doesn't work sometimes so you have to get the little thing that you push and uh, by the and then all of a sudden you go whoosh, and there's you can see the flame bitterness wrath anger as a human being we could show this by the expression on our face by the narrowing of our eyes the smoldering rags of wrath burst into open flames of anger in the attic of our mind I didn't say that, I just read it. That was good. A next, clamor. Ding, 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 ding. That's just like a fire alarm bell. And here goes the truck out, and there's the little Dalmatian. And it's just, that's the sound of a fire truck leaving. You know why? Because you need to wake everybody up. It's dangerous to be asleep when the whole neighborhood's burning down. Ding, 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 ding. Shouting or crying, pick your poison. We're going to have some loud speech. Now calm down. I'm not shouting. I'm not. Shh, the neighbors are all, you know, opening their windows to see what tonight's bout will be like. Uh, you're red-faced and you're clamorous. Not only bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, but evil speaking. When you raise your voice, especially towards your uh, wife, your children, your grandchildren, your in-laws, your whatever, you are 180 degrees away from the Bible position of what? A soft answer turneth away wrath. Soft answer just just sucks up all the anger in the room and just and things things turn out a lot better. And when you hear yourself speaking that way, you reinforce yourself. When you're saying evil things in a loud voice, slanderous things, you're saying things to your other that you don't really mean. You say things that you wouldn't say to a stranger. You'd say, I hate you, and you know you don't hate that person. And I wish we'd never gotten married. That will never be forgotten, ever. It, it will be, hopefully, forgiven, but it will never, ever be forgotten if you can just not go down that road, especially children. What I mean, that you've never, I wish, you're the most ungrateful child I know. Can, can you imagine how that gets into somebody's heart? All kinds of cruel and cutting things that we don't mean. We know while we're saying them they're not true. 
and the devil's helpful. He agrees with them, rejoices, and, and gives you a few more. He's thought of a few more while we're sitting there. He said, let me give you one that worked great two houses over a few, a few weeks ago. Finally, you move to malice. Clamor, loud. Evil speaking, you don't mean it. It's too, too late. Well, it's not too late. You can always get forgiveness and remember to try to extend forgiveness even in these mean things. Finally, you move to malice. Malice is a desire to hurt. You, malware. You know, it's one thing if your computer doesn't work. It's another thing if it's trying to overtake you or something. Uh, that is a desire to hurt. If you're a bully, you might punch somebody. If you are a, 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 a woman, might smack her child on the face. You can't imagine them doing that, but they could. Uh, the whole time, one person loves this. It's the devil. He loves this, and that should never have happened. Finally, you can conquer this. How? Look in Proverbs 16:32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. You're not to be ruled. Who's in charge in your life? It's kind of like God's spiritual, the, the four spiritual laws. Somebody's on the throne. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. You're not to be ruled by anger, but ruled by your spirit. You're not perfect, but the spirit of God who alone knows the things of the spirit of man can equip you, especially if you're confessed up and repented up and filled up that day with the Holy Spirit uh, to, to, to function well in the home. Not ruled by anger, not to be conquered, but a conqueror. Not We are to reign in this life, R-E-I-G-N, by Jesus Christ. All right, I'm getting closer to the end. Let's talk about four steps to conquering anger. So we need to have some positive things that we can do instead of all this theoretical. First thing is you've got to start with you, and you've got to start with me. We're the problem. You must be willing to trace it back to your own stubbornness and be honest with God and honest with yourself, or you'll never deal with this. Number one, and to add, remember we're going to have four, you must recognize it. Let's see here. Yes, you must recognize that the root of bitterness is there and we can trace it back to our stubbornness and we're honest with God that it's not his fault. It's not genetic in the sense that we can't do anything about it. We may have battles that we fight more than others, but that's, that's no excuse. And then number two, you must repent of it. In Ephesians, it says you're to put away all these things. I, when it comes down to it, you do have to choose. There's a lot that goes on between our ears and in our heart, but you have to choose. I choose against it. Nobody is going to choose for you. God's not going to force you. You have to repent and deal ruthlessly with this thing called anger. Otherwise, it will destroy you and those you love. And that's the saddest testimonies of all when someone stands up and says, you know, 30 years I wasted. And hopefully it's a testimony that ends well, but it may not. They Finally, they're gone. Uh, I choose against it. Nobody's going to choose for you. God's not going to force you. Uh, it will destroy you and those that you love if you don't watch out. Here's a good one. Remember who was sitting in, in your room, in your home? The devil. You gave the devil a place. You did. You know what? You have that right and that authority if you want to. I wouldn't recommend it. But now he's there and you are going to have to be the one that takes that territory back. That's your territory, according to God. That's the husband and wives and the homes. You're in charge of that. Uh, that's the idea. The Bible says, listen to this, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You say, I don't think he'll do that. The Bible says he will. You can, you, you can try that because it should. It should be in your armamentarium. That's the idea. I gave you territory. Now I'm taking it back. I resist, rebuke, renounce you. You be gone. I... I have nothing to do with that. Uh, can I do that? Absolutely. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. You say, well, I don't believe the first, I, I believe the first one, but I don't believe the second one. Well, you're inconsistent. You're just playing games. You can believe both. That's the idea. That's the idea. Um, remember, you gave the devil that place. Uh, you've cleans, cleansed your ground so that you can order out someone who has been wrongly invited in. Your mind and spirit and soul belong to God and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, and trespassers can be removed. The Bible says that. That's not 
you know, wild theology or something. That's very straightforward and standard. Number four, not only repent of the wickedness and anger, not only renounce the devil, and you must now rely on God the Holy Spirit. The nature and your Christian life abhor a vacuum. If we've thrown the devil out, somebody else is going to have to come rushing in. I hope it's you. I hope it's you and the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you and you, and you go on setting up a beautiful life for your family and for your marriage and for your home and for everybody. Uh, that's the idea is it, it, what we should do. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind. Here's the answer. Here, this is the kind of home we want. Be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You say, Well, I'm not worth much. <laughs> no, you're not. And I'm not either. So now that we got that out of the way, what are you to do? You're to, in, in your life, which is, I know it's not the fanciest life, mine is not either, but we can because he's instructing us to be to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. What a different time. You're, the very words sound different. Anger, you know, and then you say, but kindness and, and love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Uh, uh, that's the idea. Um, don't grieve God's spirit, but rely and believe he'll come into it and manifest peace where bitterness has been there. The next time you need to love an enemy, be sure to say, don't, Lord, help me love the enemy, but Lord, love the enemy through me. Because God's just full of love. He can handle that. You and I can't. We're going to run out of stuff very quickly. Well, the last one is sanctified anger needs to be channeled. There is a good anger. It's not always a sin to be angry. Clearly, Ephesians 4.26 says to uh, uh, be angry and sin not, and if, if always a sin to be angry, then Jesus was a sinner because Jesus was angry. That can't be true. So there is a small space for anger, and I'll show it to you. In Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, uh, it says, uh, He entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him, that is, Christ, on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man with the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said to them, that is to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? To save life or to kill? They held their peace. Their heart is a rock. Their hearts are adamant. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, Christ was furious at them. Being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he saith unto the man. And I think he kept his eyes locked on them while he said, Hey, you, come here. Show these fellows your hand, your crippled hand. He said, Stretch forth thy hand. As he stretched it forth. You ever notice that? Like in, when the legs are crooked, as he stands up, they all get perfect. I mean, this is thorough, thorough healing. This is wonderful. I stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. The Pharisees, somebody said, were mean as cross-eyed snakes. They, they, uh, they, in them, the milk of human kindness had curdled. With anger, Jesus, here's, the, here's the, the summary of this. Jesus was without sin, but he was not without anger. So there is a spot there. Um, what angered the Lord Jesus Christ was not something that anybody had done to him. He doesn't retaliate when somebody does something to him. He always returns good for evil. He did not try to get even. What angered him was insensitivity to the hurts and the problems of others. These Pharisees were filled with selfishness, pride, greed. They were envious of Jesus. They didn't care a nickel for that man with a withered hand. Sometimes anger is an expression of love with those the, who you love when they're hurt. You need to get angry about some things. Oppression of the widow or poor people or people that are not being treated right ought to make you angry. False cults with false doctrine ought to make you angry. But it has to be the right kind of anger, not against the person, but against what they're doing and the sin that's taken over their life. That's the idea. Uh, can you hate the sin and still love the sinner? We answered it before. Yes, you have to, or you couldn't function. That godly anger must be like the anger of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter uh, 5, 1 through 5. That's the idea. 
in our state of Tennessee, we could use some anger. Somebody said, you need to go into the convenience store and say, look, it's 99 to 1 against you ever, ever winning a nickel. You're just, you're just delivering a, poor, uh, a tax against people that can't do math. That's, that is wrong. And when someone goes in to get their lottery ticket, say, you might as well just throw it in this box. There's no need to go through this whole ridiculous process. You're not going to win any money. And you're going to be right 99.9999999 at, at the time. And then you go into the other store and say, hey, you've got vegetables, you've got fruits, you've got medicines, and you've got a bunch of hard liquor over here, and you're selling marijuana around the corner. Uh, and your place, your, your store is not watching out for this. Are you for health or for not health? Are you for helping people that come in here or destroying them that come in here? Just be one or the other. We can know how to deal with you, but we don't know what to do with you. Does your doctor do abortions? If she does, if she does, why do you go to her? There's lots of good uh, pro-life gynecologists, lots of them, and I'm so proud. Uh, but you can just saturate those other ones with your absence. You, and you don't have to be a smart aleck. You don't have to be mean. Show your love for somebody that's tangled up in the wrong situation as very best you can. But just freely, firmly, fairly say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't leave, and I, I, I respect you enough as a doctor. I want to tell you why. And I hope you'll consider what I say, and I hope maybe you'll come back and I could use you again you know just be very don't, don't throw don't throw fits or anything it should be anger that loves the person but hates the crime it should be that anger that loves the person but hates the crime and does something positive about it so I thought this was good he really got a hold of the a whole idea of anger in just one lesson sudden anger needs to be controlled sinful anger needs to be condemned stubborn anger needs to be conquered and sanctified anger needs to be channeled and we have to think about these things because we can sure foul them up. Even that last one I mentioned, do it right. Speak the truth in love. That balance is very, very hard. Well, I think next week, I did the lesson last night, and now I can't remember which one's for next week, but we've got 12 of these lessons, so there's nine more um, as far as the, God's answer to the lack of wisdom, the Proverbs are just a rich treasury <clears throat> of wisdom. Lord, thank you today for the uh, treasury in Proverbs, and thank you for the wisdom in, in the Bible, and help us to take it in and distill it down and apply it to our life, and help us to do so wisely and courteously and speaking the truth with love. Amen.